Something powerful happens when a child of God seeks to know more about Him and His beloved Son. Nowhere are those truths taught more clearly and powerfully than in the Book of Mormon. God always provides safety for the soul, and with the Book of Mormon He has again done that in our time. Remember this declaration by Jesus Himself, Whoso treasureth up my word shall not be deceived. And in the last days, neither your heart nor your faith will fail you. Chapter 4 Alma baptizes thousands of converts. Iniquity enters the church, and the church's progress is hindered. Nephi Ha is appointed chief judge. Alma, as high priest, devotes himself to the ministry, about 86 to 83 B.C. Now it came to pass in the sixth year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi that there were no contentions nor wars in the land of Zarahemla. But the people were afflicted, yea, greatly afflicted for the loss of their brethren, and also for the loss of their flocks and herds, and also for the loss of their fields of grain, which were trodden underfoot and destroyed by the Lamanites. And so great were their afflictions that every soul had cause to mourn. And they believed that it was the judgments of God sent upon them because of their wickedness and their abominations. Therefore they were awakened to a remembrance of their duty. And they began to establish the church more fully. Yea, and many were baptized in the waters of Sidon and were joined to the church of God. Yea, they were baptized by the hand of Alma, who had been consecrated the high priest over the people of the church by the hand of his father, Alma. And it came to pass, in the seventh year of the reign of the judges, there were about 3,500 souls that united themselves to the church of God and were baptized. This is really, really incredible and miraculous. 3,500 people got baptized. And did you catch where they were baptized? The waters of Sidon. And two chapters ago, we read about the waters of Sidon. That's the same waters that all of the dead bodies from the Lamanites and the Amlicites were drug into. So Alma had the people move all the bodies into the waters of Sidon. And now, just three years later, 3,500 people are baptized in that same water. And thus ended the seventh year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi. And there was continual peace in all that time. And it came to pass in the eighth year of the reign of the judges that the people of the church began to wax proud because of their exceeding riches and their fine silks and their fine twined linen and because of their many flocks and herds and their gold and their silver and all manner of precious things which they had obtained by their industry. And in all these things they were lifted up in the pride of their eyes, for they began to wear very costly apparel. Now this was the cause of much affliction to Alma, yea, and to many of the people whom Alma had consecrated to be teachers and priests and elders over the church. Yea, many of them were sorely grieved for the wickedness which they saw had begun to be among their people. So it sounds like they began to live very pridefully and having all things in abundance and, you know, fine twined linen many flocks and herds, gold, silver, precious things. So lots of things that they just felt like were in excess, like gluttonous. And that's how, that is what happened to King Noah. That's one of the downfalls that he had is that he cared so much about stuff. It said all things were in abundance for King Noah. And it sounds like that's what's happening right now to the Nephites. And it says that this was the cause of much affliction to Alma. Alma has seen this before. He's seen these patterns before. And so he's getting really, really worried about his people. It says that he was sorely grieved for the wickedness. For they saw and beheld with great sorrow that the people of the church began to be lifted up in the pride of their eyes and to set their hearts upon riches and upon the vain things of the world that they began to be scornful one towards another, and they began to persecute those that did not believe according to their own will and pleasure. And thus, in this eighth year of the reign of the judges, there began to be a great contentions among the people of the church. 
Yea, there were envyings and strife and malice and persecutions and pride, even to exceed the pride of those who did not belong to the church of God. And thus ended the eighth year of the reign of the judges. And the wickedness of the church was a great stumbling block to those who did not belong to the church. And thus the church began to fail in its progress. And it came to pass in the commencement of the ninth year, Alma saw the wickedness of the church. And he saw also that the example of the church began to lead those who were unbelievers on from one piece of iniquity to another, thus bringing on the destruction of the people. Yea, he saw great inequality among the people, some lifting themselves up with their pride, despising others, turning their backs upon the needy and the naked and those who were hungry and those who were athirst and those who were sick and afflicted. So he's, he's literally witnessing the downfall of his people. They started to care way more about stuff than each other. It says that they had, they turned their backs on the needy, the naked, the hungry, the thirsty, the sick and afflicted. They just turned away from them. Now this was a great cause for lamentations among the people. While others were abasing themselves, succoring those who stood in need of their succor, such as imparting of their substance to the poor and the needy, feeding the hungry and suffering all manner of afflictions for Christ's sake, who should come according to the spirit of prophecy, looking forward to that day, thus retaining a remission of their sins, being filled with great joy because of the resurrection of the dead, according to the will and power and deliverance of Jesus Christ from the bands of death. And now it came to pass that Alma, having seen the afflictions of the humble followers of God, and the persecutions which were heaped upon them by the remainder of his people, and seeing all their inequality, began to be very sorrowful. Nevertheless, the Spirit of the Lord did not fail him. Do you love that phrase as much as I do? Nevertheless, the Spirit of the Lord did not fail him. Even though Alma is feeling so heartbroken and sad and mournful and He's just watching his people head straight towards destruction. And he's telling them and they're not listening. But I love that it says that the Spirit of the Lord did not fail him. And he selected a wise man who was among the elders of the church and gave him power according to the voice of the people, that he might have power to enact laws according to the laws which had been given and to put them in force according to the wickedness and the crimes of the people. Now this man's name was Nephiha, and he was appointed chief judge, and he sat in the judgment seat to judge and to govern the people. Now Alma did not grant unto him the office of being high priest over the church, but he retained the office of high priest unto himself, but he delivered the judgment seat unto Nephiha. So Alma is still the prophet. He's still leading the church. He's the high priest, but Nephiha is one of the judges now. And this he did that he himself might go forth among his people or among the people of Nephi, that he might preach the word of God unto them to stir them up in remembrance of their duty and that he might pull down by the word of God all the pride and craftiness and all of the contentions which were among his people, seeing no way that he might reclaim them, save it were in bearing down in pure testimony against them. So what do we do? What's the, what's the most important thing that we do when people are falling away? We love them, of course. But it says here, Nephi says that the bearing down in pure testimony. We bear pure testimony. Alma gives us one of the best tools that we need to do to help others and to bring people back to the Savior. And he says bearing down of pure testimony. Bear your pure testimony. You don't have to know everything. You just have to say what you know to be true. If you don't know if one aspect of the gospel is true, but you know that Joseph Smith was a prophet, or you know that the Holy Ghost is real, you know that Jesus Christ lives, you know that tithing has blessed your life, or fasting has blessed your life, Bear what you know to be true and bear what you hope to be true and what you're living your life according to 
how you want the Lord to bless you. Remember, we talk about this. The Lord tells us, I, the Lord, am bound when ye do what I say. When ye do not what I say, ye have no promise. So the Lord says, when you're obedient, I'm bound. I will do everything that I've told you because that's the, that's the agreement that we made. That's our covenant. And the, there's only one person who could break that covenant. Only one. And it's not Heavenly Father. It's us. So it's up to us if we want these blessings and these covenants from the Lord. Bear pure testimony against people. And even if you're worried that they're going to stump you and ask a question that you don't know, you don't have to know it. You just testify what you know. You can say, I don't know that. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that Jesus Christ lives. And I do know that he's coming back soon and that he will redeem his people. I do know that the law of tithing is real and that we are blessed in abundance when we pay our tithing. You just testify of what you know. That's your testimony. And thus, in the commencement of the ninth year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi, Alma delivered up the judgment seat to Nephi Ha and confined himself wholly to the high priesthood of the holy order of God, to the testimony of the word, according to the spirit of revelation and prophecy. Chapter 5 So these are the words which Alma the high priest according to the holy order of God, delivered to the people in their cities and villages throughout the land. So this will comprise a few chapters. To gain salvation, men must repent and keep the commandments, be born again, cleanse their garments through the blood of Christ, be humble and strip themselves of pride and envy, and do the works of righteousness. The good shepherd calls his people. Those who do evil works are children of the devil. Alma testifies of the truth of his doctrine and commands men to repent. The names of the righteous will be written in the book of life. About 83 BC. Now it came to pass that Alma began to deliver the word of God unto the people, first in the land of Zarahemla, and from thence throughout all the land. And these are the words which he spake to the people in the church, which was established in the city of Zarahemla, according to his own record, saying, I, Alma, having been consecrated by my father, Alma, to be a high priest over the church of God, he having power and authority from God to do these things, behold, I say unto you that he began to establish a church in the land which was in the borders of Nephi, yea, the land which was called the land of Mormon, yea, and he did baptize his brethren in the waters of Mormon. And behold, I say unto you, they were delivered out of the hands of the people of King Noah by the mercy and power of God. And behold, after that, they were brought into bondage by the hands of the Lamanites in the wilderness. Yea, I say unto you, they were in captivity. And again, the Lord did deliver them out of bondage by the power of his word. And we were brought into this land. And here we began to establish the church of God throughout this land also. So Alma's just giving a quick little recap of like, this is where we've come. This is, he talked about his dad a little bit and what his dad went through and then his role in the gospel. And now, behold, I say unto you, my brethren, you that belong to this church, have you sufficiently retained in remembrance the captivity of your fathers? Yea, and have you sufficiently retained in remembrance his mercy and long suffering towards them? And moreover, have you sufficiently retained in remembrance that he has delivered their souls from hell? Behold, he changed their hearts. Yea, he awakened them out of a deep sleep and they awoke unto God. Behold, they were in the midst of darkness. Nevertheless, their souls were illuminated by the light of the everlasting word. Yea, they were encircled about by the bands of death and the chains of hell, and an everlasting destruction did await them. And now I ask of you, my brethren, were they destroyed? Behold, I say unto you, nay, they were not. And again I ask, were the bands of death broken, and the chains of hell which encircled them about, were they loosed? I say unto you, yea, they were loosed, and their souls did expand, and they did sing redeeming love. Pay attention to all the times it talks about singing. Like I have told you, and will tell you again, go to your word choir. <laughs> I never liked the sound of a choir when I was younger. 
until I understood that when we unite our voices together with other saints that want to praise the Lord, it's powerful and it's unifying. And to me, singing is the most sacred form of worship because you can sing from your heart. You can sing from your soul. I love singing and I especially love singing to the Lord. And they did sing redeeming love. And I say unto you that they are saved. Now I ask of you, on what conditions are they saved? Yea, what grounds had they to hope for salvation? What is the cause of their being loosed from the bands of death? Yea, and also the chains of hell. Behold, I can tell you, did not my father Alma believe in the words which were delivered by the mouth of Abinadi? And was he not a holy prophet? Did he not speak the words of God, and my father Alma believed them? And according to his faith, there was a mighty change wrought in his heart. Behold, I say unto you that this is all true. And behold, he preached the word unto your fathers, and a mighty change was also wrought in their hearts. And they humbled themselves and put their trust in the true and living God. And behold, they were faithful until the end. Therefore, they were saved. And now behold, I ask of you, my brethren of the church, have you spiritually been born of God? Alma is giving us one of the greatest series of questions that I think I've ever read. And he really, really wants us to understand what it means to be converted to the Lord. And he knows because he's been on the other side. He has utilized the atonement of Jesus Christ in his life and now has this capacity to understand what these questions mean. And please don't misunderstand that I'm saying that you have to be the vilest of sinners, like Alma and the sons of Mosiah were called, in order to understand the atonement. That is not at all what I'm saying. Anytime we repent, anytime we come to the Lord to sanctify us, to change us, to purify us, we are using his atonement in our lives and we are becoming changed. Anybody who repents can have that story, the same story as Alma the Younger, but you just didn't have to be the vilest of sinners to get there. So Alma asks, have you spiritually been born of God? Have you received his image in your countenances? Have you experienced this mighty change in your hearts? I love that Alma right here asks if we've spiritually been born of God. I used to live in Tennessee. I was out there for a few years singing country music. I loved it. Some of the greatest people ever live out there. Um, but I had a lot of friends of other faiths, and that's right in the heart of the Bible Belt. And I remember people would ask me things like, are you born again? Are you, have you been born of God? Are you born again? And that seems... If you don't really understand, it seems a little bit contrary to some of our doctrine, unless you really know the doctrine, <laughs> because right here, what Alma is saying to us is born again. Have you spiritually been born of God? That's different than a physical birth. That is saying, have you received his image in your countenance? Like he asks us, do people look at you and feel the love of the savior? Do people talk to you and feel the love of the savior? and feel light, and feel hope, and feel peace through you, and through your example. That's what Alma's asking us. And then he says, have ye experienced this mighty change in your hearts? This is all conversion to the Lord. He is showing us exactly how to get onto this covenant path with the Lord. And this actually is the path to translation, which the more I learn about that, the more I see this pattern in the scriptures over and over and over, especially in the Book of Mormon. Do ye exercise faith in the redemption of him who created you? Do you look forward with an eye of faith and view this mortal body raised in immortality and this corruption raised in incorruption to stand before God to be judged according to the deeds which have been done in the mortal body? I say unto you, can you imagine to yourselves that ye hear the voice of the Lord saying unto you in that day, Come unto me, ye blessed. For behold, 
Your works have been the works of righteousness upon the face of the earth. So Alma's saying to us, can you imagine the Lord saying that to you? Come unto me, ye blessed, for your works have been the works of righteousness upon the face of the earth. Or do ye imagine to yourselves that ye can lie unto the Lord in that day and say, Lord, our works have been righteous works upon the face of the earth and that he will save you? Or otherwise, can ye imagine yourselves brought before the tribunal of God with your souls filled with guilt and remorse, having a remembrance of all your guilt, yea, a perfect remembrance of all your wickedness, yea, a remembrance that ye have set at defiance the commandments of God? I say unto you, can ye look up to God at that day with a pure heart and clean hands? I say unto you, can you look up, having the image of God engraven upon your countenances? I love the word engraven. He's not saying the image of God placed upon or shown through you. He's saying engraven, actually physically engraven on your countenance should be the image of God. I say unto you, can you think of being saved when you have yielded yourselves to become subjects to the devil? I say unto you, ye will know at that day that ye cannot be saved. For there can no man be saved except his garments are washed white. Yea, his garments must be purified until they are cleansed from all stain through the blood of him who has been spoken by our fathers, who should come to redeem his people from their sins. Let's talk about pure hearts and clean hands for a minute. So he asks us, can you look up to God at that day with a pure heart and clean hands? A pure heart is our motives, our attributes, what we think, what we feel, how we feel about other people, our intentions, our disposition, our purity, and clean hands, those are our actions. Those are the things that we do because our heart has been purified. Then what do we do about it? Do we serve? Do we love? Do we do temple work? Do we do family history? Do we serve our families? What are we doing? Yea, his garments must be purified until they are cleansed from all stain through the blood of him of whom it has been spoken by our fathers, who should come to redeem his people from their sins. And now I ask of you, my brethren, how will any of you feel if ye shall stand before the bar of God, having your garments stained with blood and all manner of filthiness? Behold, what will these things testify against you? Behold, will they not testify that ye are murderers? Yea, and also they are and also that ye are guilty of all manner of wickedness? Behold, my brethren, do ye suppose that such an one can have a place to sit down in the kingdom of God with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and also all the holy prophets, whose garments are cleansed and are spotless, pure and white. I say unto you, Nay, except ye make our Creator a liar from the beginning, or suppose that he is a liar from the beginning, ye cannot suppose that such can have place in the kingdom of heaven. But they shall be cast out, for they are the children of the kingdom of the devil. And now behold, I say unto you, My brethren, if ye have experienced a change of heart, and if ye have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, there is a singing reference again, I would ask, can ye feel so now? Have ye walked, keeping yourselves blameless before God? So you know those times in your life, maybe it was right after girls camp, and you bore your testimony, and the Spirit was so strong or right after EFY, and you felt the Spirit the whole week, and you had so much fun, and, and just knew that's where the Lord needed you to be. Or maybe it's right after trek. You go to trek, and you're trekking, and you feel the Spirit of the pioneers, and you feel some of their struggles and their trials, and you feel the Lord's Spirit so strong. And then we get home, and then we get distracted, we get bogged down, we get weighed down by the world and by other things that we have to do. And Alma is trying to say to us, if we have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, can you feel so now? 
if we felt that peace, if we felt the burning that tells us of truth, do we feel that now? Are we doing things in our lives to access the Spirit of the Lord? Are we obedient? Are we doing the small things? Are we reading our scriptures? Are we praying? As much as I love doing these videos, I do. It's such a blessing for me in my own life. I feel peace. I feel hope. I feel calm. And I feel guided when I speak in these videos. But the best way, the very best way for you to study the scriptures is for you to read them on your own by yourself, you and the Lord. That will always be the best way. Here I'm telling you some of my impressions, some of my thoughts, and I pray that they can be a blessing for you in your life. And the Lord can prompt you things as you're hearing somebody else read the scriptures. But when you begin on your own a serious study of the Book of Mormon, you will have such an incredible power come into your life. So the very best way to study the Book of Mormon is to read it on your own. But if that's difficult for you, or uh, if you have a commute, or this is for your children, I'm really grateful that you're here because I feel like I get to study the scriptures with you and read through these incredible words and study these incredible stories with these incredible people. So I'm grateful that you're here. But if you have a chance, make time to read the scriptures on your own too. Could you say, if you were called to die at this time within yourselves, that ye have been sufficiently humble, that your garments have been cleansed and made white through the blood of Christ, who will come to redeem his people from their sins? So this is such a good gut check for all of us. Where are you at? If it was your time to be called home to Heavenly Father, have you been sufficiently humble? Are there things that you need to repent of that you haven't repented of yet? Are you stripped of pride? I say unto you, if ye are not, ye are not prepared to meet God. Behold, ye must prepare quickly, for the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand, and such an one hath not eternal life. Behold, I say unto you, is there one among you who is not stripped of envy? I say unto you that such an one is not prepared, and I would that he should prepare quickly, for the hour is close at hand, and he knoweth not when the time shall come, for such an one is not found guiltless. And again I say unto you, Is there one among you that doth make a mock of his brother, or that heapeth upon him persecutions? Woe unto such an one, for he is not prepared, and the time is at hand that he must repent or he cannot be saved. Yea, woe, yea, even woe unto all ye workers of iniquity. Repent, repent, for the Lord God hath spoken it. Behold, he sendeth an invitation unto all men, for the arms of mercy are extended towards them. And he saith, Repent, and I will receive you. Yea, he saith, Come unto me, and ye shall partake of the fruit of the tree of life. Yea, ye shall eat and drink of the bread and the waters of life freely. Yea, come unto me and bring forth works of righteousness, and ye shall not be hewn down and cast into the fire. For behold, the time is at hand that whosoever bringeth forth not good fruit, or whosoever doeth not the works of righteousness, the same have cause to wail and to mourn. O ye workers of iniquity, ye that are puffed up in the vain things of the world, Ye that have professed to have known the ways of righteousness, nevertheless have gone astray, as sheep having no shepherd. Notwithstanding, a shepherd hath called after you, and is still calling after you, but ye will not hearken unto his voice. Behold, I say unto you, that the good shepherd doth call you, yea, and in his own name he doth call you, which is the name of Christ. And if he will not hearken unto the voice of the good shepherd, to the name by which ye are called, behold, ye are not the sheep of the good shepherd. So Christ calls us by his own name. And I just want to reiterate really quick. Alma, if there's one theme that Alma is telling us, it is the word repent, 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 repent. And I will tell you in verse 27, 
in verse 28, verse 29, 31, 36, 50, and 52, he talks about something in all of those verses. And every single one of them, he's telling us that the time is soon quickly approaching, that the Savior's coming, and that we won't have time to repent after that. Verse 27, he says, at this time. Verse 28, prepare quickly. Verse 29, prepare quickly. Verse 31, the time is at hand. In verse 29, he also says, the time is, the hour is close at hand. Verse 36, again, the time is at hand. Verse 50, the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand. The kingdom of heaven shall very soon shine forth. Verse 52, the axe is laid at the root of the tree. And if you remember the allegory of the olive tree, the olive tree is preserved. And the servant of the vineyard keeps saying, but please give me more time, just more time. I can, I can have more, more fruit grow, more leaves grow, more grafting take, more healthy trees, which really means more people converted to the gospel of, Z of Jesus Christ. And they say in that allegory that the axe is laid at the root of the tree, that the time will come when the Lord has to cut down the trees. And in verse 52, we're reminded of that too. And now, if ye are not the sheep of the good shepherd, of what fold are ye? Behold, I say unto you that the devil is your shepherd, for ye are of his fold. And now who can deny this? Behold, I say unto you, whosoever denieth this is a liar and a child of the devil. So he's trying to say there are only two shepherds. There are only two masters. No man can serve two masters. No man can follow two shepherds. It's either you follow the Savior, Jesus Christ, or you follow the devil. That's it. For I say unto you, that whatsoever is good cometh from God, and whatsoever is evil cometh from the devil. Therefore, if a man bringeth forth good works, he hearkeneth unto the voice of the good shepherd, and he doth follow him. But whosoever bringeth forth evil works, the saying becometh a child of the devil. For he hearkeneth unto his voice, and doth follow him. And whosoever doth this, and whosoever doeth this, must receive his wages of him. Therefore, for his wages he receiveth death, as to things pertaining unto righteousness, being dead unto all good works. And now, my brethren, I would that ye should hear me. And now, my brethren, I would that ye should hear me. For I speak in the energy of my soul. For behold, I have spoken unto you plainly that ye cannot err, or have spoken according to the commandments of God. For I am called to speak after this manner according to the holy order of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Yea, I am commanded to stand and testify unto this people the things which have been spoken by our fathers concerning the things which are to come. And this is not all. Do ye not suppose that I know of these things myself? Behold, I testify unto you that I do know these things, whereof I have spoken are true. Behold, I testify unto you that I do know that these things whereof I have spoken are true. And how do you suppose that I know of their surety? Behold, I say unto you, they are made known unto me by the Holy Spirit of God. Behold, I have fasted and prayed many days that I might know these things of myself. And now I do know of myself that they are true. For the Lord God hath made them manifest unto me by his Holy Spirit. And this is the spirit of revelation which is in me. I love this. Alma credited the spirit, which is the Lord, for manifesting truth to him. Not the angel. Not the angel that came and told him to stop persecuting the church and his dad. He's talking about the Holy Ghost confirming truth to him, and that is his conversion. Conversion comes through fasting and prayer, not miraculous visitations. If you're waiting for an angel or a sign or a miraculous experience to convince you that the church is true, that's not conversion. That's sign seeking. You don't want to be a sign seeker, trust me. The sign seekers in the Book of Mormon were struck dumb, died, um, were in comas for a few days. <laughs> You don't want to be a sign seeker. You want to be a Christ seeker. You want to be somebody who 
goes to the Lord through fasting, through prayer, through scriptures, and gets a confirmation from him that way. We have access to the exact same type of communication that our prophet does, that the brethren do, that the leaders of our church have. We have that. We have the Holy Ghost, which is pure intelligence and testifies of truth. We have that. And that is what will convert us to Jesus Christ and to his gospel. Not angels, not miraculous visitations. Although those do happen. I promise you, they do happen. And I also know that they happen when the Lord wants them to happen, not necessarily when we are expecting things like that to happen. And that you don't have to have that happen in order to know that the church is true. And moreover, I say unto you, that it has thus been revealed unto me that the words which have been spoken by our fathers are true. Even so, according to the spirit of prophecy which is in me, which is also by the manifestations of the Spirit of God, I say unto you that I know of myself that whatsoever I shall say unto you concerning that which is to come is true. And I say unto you that I know that Jesus Christ shall come, yea, the Son, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and mercy and truth, And behold, it is he that cometh to take away the sins of the world, yea, the sins of every man who steadfastly believeth on his name. And now I say unto you that this is the order after which I am called, yea, to preach unto my beloved brethren, yea, and every one that dwelleth in the land, yea, to preach unto all, both old and young, both bond and free, yea, I say unto you, the aged, and also the middle-aged, and the rising and the rising generation, yea, to cry unto them that they must repent and be born again. Yea, thus saith the Spirit, Repent, all ye ends of the earth, for the, for the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand. Yea, the Son of God cometh in his glory, in his might, majesty, power, and dominion. Yea, my beloved brethren, I say unto you that the Spirit saith, Behold, the glory of the King of all the earth, And also the king of heaven shall very soon shine forth among all the children of men. And also the Spirit saith unto me, Yea, crieth unto me with a mighty voice, saying, Go forth and say unto this people, Repent. For except ye repent, ye can in no wise inherit the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, the Spirit saith, Behold, the axe is laid at the root of the tree. That's what we were talking about. Therefore every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit shall be hewn down and cast into the fire. Yea, a fire which cannot be consumed, even an unquenchable fire. Behold and remember, the Holy One hath spoken it. And now, my beloved brethren, I say unto you, can ye withstand these sayings? Yea, can ye lay aside these things and trample the Holy One under your feet? Yea, can ye be puffed up in the pride of your hearts? Yea, will ye still persist in the wearing of costly apparel and setting your hearts upon the vain things of the world, upon your riches? Yea, will ye persist in supposing that ye are better one than another? Yea, will ye persist in the persecution of your brethren who humble themselves and do walk after the holy order of God, wherewith they have been brought into this church, having been sanctified by the Holy Spirit, and they do bring forth works which are meet for repentance? I love that. Works which are meet for repentance. So, we, faith without works is dead right? And works is like the fruits of what we're doing. We talked about pure hearts and clean hands. Our hearts are, when our hearts are where they need to be, then our hands can do the work that the Lord needs us to do. So if we really do want to be forgiven, if we really do want to be forgiven and we really do want to repent, what are we doing? What are the actions that we're taking to show that to the Lord? What are the changes that we're making in our lives to show that we want to repent? Yea, and will you persist in turning your backs upon the poor and the needy and in withholding your substance from them? And finally, all ye that will persist in your wickedness, I say unto you that these are they who shall be hewn down and cast into the fire, except they speedily repent. And now I say unto you, all that ye are desirous to follow the voice of the good shepherd, come ye out from the wicked and be ye separate. And touch not their unclean things, and behold, their name shall be blotted out. I love talk of separation. This is last day's talk. This is like 
like wheat and tares type things. And there's a lot of prophecies about these separations. If you're feeling prompted to make changes in your life and the lives of your family, where you are separating yourself from the world, it's a good thing. I know for us, I felt prompted to take my children out of school. And I asked them, after school ended two years ago, I said, my three, my three older kids that were in school, I said, I want you, each of you, to pray about if we should homeschool. And I'm going to pray about it too. We'll come back in a month and compare notes and see how we feel. And we did that. And we came back together. And I, I had gotten my answer. I felt like the Lord was telling me that it was time to homeschool my children. And my three older kids came to me and said the same thing. Each of them said, when I prayed about it, I felt like the Lord was telling me that I needed to come home too. And that separation has been such a blessing for us. And I'm not here trying to tell everybody that they have to homeschool, but I know for us, that was the right thing. And now we're two years into it and it has blessed our lives so much. And this is just an example. If you feel called to separate somehow, do it and you'll be blessed for it. And the Lord will strengthen you and help you. I had no idea how I was going to homeschool five little children. My oldest, I have five kids less than 10 years apart. And so it was a little, um, okay, a lot overwhelming and scary and uh, a lot of unknowns. And there's some days that are still hard, but the good days are so good. I'm making this sound like I'm telling everybody to homeschool. I'm not telling you you have to, but if you want to and you feel called to do it, you can do it. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Anyway, when the Lord tells you to separate from something, no matter what it is, do it. So he says, be ye separate and touch not their unclean things. And behold, their names shall be blotted out, that the names of the wicked shall not be numbered among the names of the righteous, that the word of God may be fulfilled, which saith, the names of the wicked shall not be mingled with the names of my people. And also on the, ho on the homeschool front, just to be clear about this, I know that it is such a blessing that I'm able to homeschool. I know that because I know there are, I have actually had a lot of people reach out to me that both parents work full time. And even though they want to homeschool, it doesn't make sense how it could work because one has to go, maybe you both have to go into the office and nobody can work from home and you need those paychecks or those benefits or whatever it is. And in those situations, just be prayerful. And I do know what a blessing and what a privilege it is that I am able to stay home with my, with my children. I just want to acknowledge that. For the names of the righteous shall be written in the book of life. And unto them will I grant an inheritance at my right hand. And now, my brethren, what have ye to say against this? I say unto you, if ye speak against it, it matters not. For the word of God must be fulfilled. For what shepherd is there among you, having many sheep, doth not watch over them, that the wolves enter not and devour his flock? And behold, if a wolf enter his flock, doth he not drive him out? Yea, and at the last, if he can, he will destroy him. And now I say unto you that a good shepherd, and now I say unto you that the good shepherd doth call after you. And if you will hearken unto his voice, he will bring you into his fold, and ye are his sheep. And he commandeth you that ye suffer no ravenous wolf to enter among you, that ye may not be destroyed. And now I, Alma, do command you in the language of him who hath commanded me, that ye observe to do the words which I have spoken unto you. I speak by way of commandment. Uh -uh. I speak by way of command unto you that belong to the church. And unto those who do not belong to the church, I speak by way of invitation, saying, Come and be baptized unto repentance, that ye also may be partakers of the fruit of the tree of life.